been talking about the goodness of God. And uh, man, you got to know in every way that God is good. He's only good. He can never, there's nothing in him that's not good. But this is why we teach this, because the reason why a lot of people who don't know God are not coming to him is because they have heard things from Christians, right? And, and it makes no sense to them. And it's almost like the picture that the world has been painted of God is he, kind, he, he, he sits in heaven and he manipulates things. He blesses some and he doesn't bless others. And without people saying it, they just kind of think that there's a side of God that's not good. It's almost like, like there's, there's, there's a dark side to him, right? And, and they believe that because, you know, a child dies and, and, and goes to heaven, right? And they'll, people will say, even pastors or religious people will say, well, you know, God just had a bigger plan for that child and needed another voice in the choir or whatever. And, and you know, that person needs to be punched in the face because that's not true. <laughs> Seriously. I mean, that's just, that's, that angers me, not the person, right? But it angers me that we get into this stuff. God does not steal, kill, or destroy. And as we go through the word, you've got to know today, listen, if you're walking and your eyes are on him and, he, and you're submitted to him, and he's able to move in your life, man, that pleases God. In other words, if you're walking by faith, it pleases him. Why? Because he could get everything over to you that, that, that he has provided for you. If your lifestyle, if there are things where you're kind of keeping him out, that doesn't please him. But you got to understand, he's not mad at anybody today. He's not mad at you. Right? He's not disappointed in who you are. Boy, that's a big one. Because some people feel like, man, I'm just a disappointment. Right? You, no, no, no. When he sees you, he sees you in Christ. And he has only good plans for you. Right? So we're going to look at some things today. There are Christians, many of our brothers and sisters, you could even say millions of our brothers and sisters, don't know that he has provided healing for them. They think he heals some and not others that he blesses some and not others, right? And they'll twist scriptures and take them out of context because there's no scripture that ever says that. But we're going to stick to the word of God today, right? So let's turn to Romans chapter 12. I said all that to know where I wanted to turn. Praise God. Romans chapter 12. Let's look at this. Romans chapter 12. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Look at verse 9. It says here, it says, let, which means we have to allow this, <clears throat> let love be, in the King James it says, without dissimulation. That word in the Greek means hypocrisy. In other words, let love, the love that you walk in, be without hypocrisy. Okay? Okay? And then it says this, and this is what I want you to see. It says, abhor that which is evil. That means, this Greek word literally means to detest that which is evil. And it also means this, depart and separate yourself completely from that which is evil. <clears throat> right? And then he says, cleave to that which is good. We're to completely separate ourselves from anything that is evil and we're to cleave to that which is good. So in other words, this is message two. Last week we talked about how that you have to be able to discern good from evil. And we'll talk more about that. Um, and we might talk more about that today. We'll see how the Holy Spirit goes here, how he wants us to go. But think about this. The Bible is very clear. You're to detest 
separate yourself completely from that which is evil and cleave to that which is good. Now, if you jump down to verse 20, look at what it says. Therefore, and it says a whole bunch in between. Now, notice this is Romans 12. So how does Romans 12 start out? Right? Present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice to God. Don't be conformed to this world, but be, re- be transformed by the renewing, the renovation of your mind. It goes on to say, it talks about, listen, there's all different parts in the body, and all of us have different gifts according to the grace that's been given to us, according to the faith that's been proportioned. There's different things that we're all going to do, and then now it starts, right after that it says, now this is how you walk this out. This is how you walk in victory. You have to completely separate yourself from that which is evil, and you've got to cleave to that which is good. Now it's going to go on and keep telling us how to do that. In verse 20 it says, Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And everybody's flesh said, ouch. Right? If he thirst, give him drink. For in doing so, you shall heap coals of fire on his head. For I don't even know how long. I thought, oh yeah, man, if I do good to somebody who's, who doesn't like me, who's evil, it's like I'm heaping coals of fire on their head. Like, I'm really getting them. And then when I started studying the Bible, I realized, oh wait, the heaping coals on their head, that was in, they would do that to help people. They'd have a container that they'd carry this back to their house, and they would, they would go get the coals and put them on, help, help the person. So in other words, when you help the person, you're blessing them. Heaping coals on their head is a blessing to them. And then it finishes up. It tells you how that will benefit you. How feeding those and and giving water, blessing those that are against you, that are hurting you, this is how it affects you. Be not overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. Good is so much more powerful than evil. There's no comparison. Light is so much greater than darkness. Light dispels darkness. Good dispels evil. Right? So this is telling us how to walk in victory. Why do we do good to those that despitefully use us? Because they're not our enemy. Satan's our enemy. We never let the sun go down on our anger of him. But we love people. Doesn't mean you have to be a doormat. What is is the middle of the road for us? It's very simple. The Holy Spirit will lead you. He will lead you in what to do. Right? So this this is real important that we just learned this. So now go over to the 119th Psalm. Psalm 119. Let's look at verse 68. Man, I feel like I could just talk about the goodness of God for like a month. Psalm 119. I don't mean four Sundays, I mean a month. There's just so many scriptures. Now remember, we've got to define good from evil, right? I love this scripture. Right at the first half of this scripture, it makes this statement. Psalm 119, verse 68 I have this highlighted in my Bible. It says, you are good and you do good. That's who God is. Not only, see, God doesn't just have goodness, he is good. God doesn't just love, he is love. But this is saying he's he's good and he does good. Now remember, we said this last week, the word good, it, it appears 813 times in scripture and knowing knowing me we might go through all 813 scriptures right but we're not going to get in a hurry i love this right where this scripture is i've written the the definition of good the hebrew and greek definition of good if you take those greek words and those hebrew words and you develop a, 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 a definition this would be the definition good means 
pleasant. It means beautiful. It means excellent. It also means rich, talking about financial. It means prosperous, which is dealing with a lot more than financial. It means well, appropriate. This word means beneficial, happy, honest, and right. We're to cleave to that, right? Listen, if it's not beneficial, be careful, right? Because some things can look beneficial, but they're not beneficial, right? Noah Webster, you know, Noah Webster was a great man of God. I think they said he had the whole, he could, he could quote the whole Bible. I mean, this guy was brilliant. In Noah Webster's, I have his original dictionary. It's, it's gigantic. Uh, and, and the word good, I mean, the, the book is, is this big. And, and there's one whole page defines good. It takes a whole page. In the, and, and we're talking you might, the microscopic version. It's re, you know, real, real small lettering. But this, this, it would be the definition out of all that whole page I would boil it down to this, complete or sufficient in its kind. The Bible says every good gift, every perfect good gift. When God, if it's from God, it's perfect, it's, it's complete. But he is good and he does good. Now I'd love to take a lot of time, but I, I think I just want to focus, go to Genesis Scary thought. We're going to Genesis 1-1, right? We better... I don't think I'm going to read the whole creation of a, account, but one thing that he says every day, and God saw that it was good. Then he did this, and God saw that it was good. So this is in the beginning when God created the heavens and the earth. It says, in the beginning, 1-1, God created the heaven and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light, or he said this, light be. Now, if you fast forward to where we are now, they literally can calculate there was a point in time where all of a sudden there was an explosion of light and they can actually now go back and tell us how many years ago that was. That's when God said light be. Light is still expanding. The universe is expanding at the speed of light still, right? Not only is God holding everything together with the word of his power, he's still creating, right? And yet people believe that there was this little primeval ooze that crawled up on a crystal and that's where everything came from. My question is, where'd the planet come from? Right? Well, God tells us. But then, he always said all this. Let there be light. God saw the light and it was good. So this is, this is what I want you to see. So... A Rolex watch, right? The most expensive Rolex watch. Could you get a Rolex watch and take it out of Walmart? Right? Could you go to Walmart, get a Rolex watch, and walk out of a Walmart after you got a Rolex watch? Right? Yeah, that doesn't count. You can't buy it off some dude who's shopping with a Rolex watch, right? <laughs> why, why, can't you, why can't you purchase a Rolex watch from Walmart, one of their stores, and take it out of their store? Because it's not in their store. Okay? As we go through this, you need to realize the Bible says, in God is only light. 
There is no, in some translation, I think it's the Weiss translation, it even says there's not even a particle of darkness in him. The reason why God could say let there be light is because that's what's in him. It's only light. It's only good. The reason why God can't possibly be evil, there's no evil in him. If you look at the creation account, if you go through the whole creation account, do you see any? And then God created sickness and disease. And he said that it was good. It's, you're, you're sitting here going, Pastor, that's stupid. It is. He never, in the creation account, there's no sickness and disease. What, is there? No, nothing. So now look at verse 31. Verse 31 of Genesis now, this is at the end of everything. Remember, he had, he had created everything. He, put, he created man, right? He spoke everything into existence. But man, it literally, he formed his body with dirt. I've heard an Oxford professor years ago prove to me how God could make a human body out of dirt. That was way above my head at the time, right? This guy was a, the leading evolutionist in the 70s. And I, I think Pastor Edwin, we were talking about this yesterday. And he put, what is it called? Is it called scientific law? Scientific method, that's it. So he had this thought, he was a, he was a leading evolutionist. And then he thought one day, he's like, I'm going to put scientific method to evolution. And it didn't work. He could not prove evolution with scientific method. So then he had this thought, I'm going to put scientific method to creation. And it completely worked. He got born again. And now I'm, I'm at Calvary Chapel in Costa Mesa, Chuck Smith's church, and he's doing a seminar. And he proved how that God could make man out of dirt, man's body out of dirt. And then the Bible says after he made man's body, he breathed into man his spirit. He took something of himself, and man became a living soul. When I was in a cultural anthropology class after I got out of high school, uh, you know, the first statement in this class was evolution is no longer theory, it's fact. And you know, the teacher kicked me out a few times. We ended up becoming friends. I was young and stupid and just, you know, uh, I, would, I would stand up and say crazy stuff. I'm like, hey, so if I blew up my Ford Maverick, would I have a Ferrari? He's like, Tony, <laughs> please leave, right? <laughs> but you know, he would say the, the, the genetic makeup of a gorilla is a lot like a human body. And I'm like, yeah, okay, so what does that have to do with anything? And he's like, well, see, we came from, we came from gorillas. I'm like, well, why are there still gorillas then? And, and by the way, the Bible doesn't say, the Bible says that I'm a speaking spirit. That gorilla doesn't have a spirit, you know? Now, deal with this. That means your dog's not going to go to heaven or your cat's not going to go to heaven, okay? So enjoy them down here. Now, there, now there, there might be another one up there that looks a lot like your little fluffy or whatever, but God will, God will wipe the tears from your eyes and you'll be okay, right? So God makes man, he makes everything. And then in verse 31, look at what it says. And God saw everything that he had made. And behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Now, what I, another thing I, I need you to see as we go into this, we, we kind of think of this. Well, this is good. But man, then there's great. Right? With God, when he says good... There's nothing better than that, okay? So look at what it says, chapter 2. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. Okay? Notice there's no evil. He didn't create evil. There was nothing in the world that was not good that he made. Now, Satan was here. 
But Satan was a non-issue. Because the first thing he did with man, as we see in the creation account, he gave him dominion over Satan. And he said, you have sovereign authority in the earth. You subdue and conquer this planet. You keep him and everything under, under, under your control. In the same way, guess what? God has only good for you. Do you know, and this is where we're going to go with this, do you know that you have been, you, the Bible says you're his workmanship, you've been created in Christ Jesus. Do you know there is nothing in you that's not good? In you, right now, there's nothing in you that's not good. But why do I do stupid things? Why do I, right? It's just you have to renew your mind. The word of God has to pull some junk out, right? We're, we're putting a new break room in our church. Guess what they're going to do before they put any new stuff in there? They're going to tear out all the old stuff. And that's what God's word will do, right? A counselor can help you deal with stuff if you go to a good counselor, if they're not spirit-filled, filled with the word, and know who God is, I'd be real careful. But a counselor could help you to put some stuff together, but you're never going to get free unless the word of God pulls out the detrimental thought process. Because God has made you free, and everything in you is good. Why? Because he's only good. He only creates good things. Right? So this is here we have creation. you got to know this. There is nothing that he created that was ever evil. So now let's jump all the way to the New Testament. Let's go to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10 in verse 38. Look at what it says. So now Jesus shows up. Okay? And it says here how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. In the literal Greek would say how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost. And then it would get all exciting, even with power. And what did he do? He went about doing good. When you look at what God has for you, he has He's going to empower you to do good works. He went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. So we're looking here. Now go to 1 John chapter 3 in verse 8. 1 John chapter 3 in verse 8. Hallelujah. It says, he that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sins from the be sinned from the beginning, sinneth from the beginning. And then it, this is what I want you to see. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested. He was made visible. He stepped out of eternity, took upon himself flesh, and he dwelt among us. This is why he dwelt among us that he might destroy the works of the devil. And he did it, right? So now let's go to Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6, and we're going to look at verse 6. Luke chapter 6. Oh, man, this is so exciting. If I run out of here, I'll be back. Man, this just explodes. It explodes in me. This is why I can't get enough of his word. Luke 6, 6, look at this. Here's a man that has a withered hand. Okay, look at what it says. And it came to pass on another Sabbath that he, Jesus, entered into the synagogue and taught. And there was a man whose right hand was withered. So it was drawn up. He could not stretch it out. His hand, right? And the scribes and the Pharisees were watching or watched him whether he would heal on the Sabbath day that they might find accusation against him. 
Are you kidding me? You are giving your whole life in service of God who is good, and now you're coming to church because you've heard Jesus is going to be at this synagogue, and it's the Sabbath, and, they, and boy, they're watching Jesus because they see Jesus. He's standing there, and he keeps looking at that guy with the withered hand, and they're like, oh, here we go. We're going to get him again. Religion. Religion. But he knew their thoughts and said to the man which had the withered hand, Rise up and stand forth in the midst. And the man stood up, arose and stood forth. And Jesus said unto them, I will ask, I said unto them who? To the Pharisees, to the religious leaders who are thinking these things. I will ask you one thing. Is it lawful on the Sabbath day to do good or evil? Wow. Wow. To save life or destroy it. In the mouth of Jesus, to save life is good. To destroy life is evil. Okay, this is pretty plain, right? And looking round about upon them all, he said unto the man, stretch forth your hand. And he did so. Isn't that amazing? Jesus asked the man to do something he couldn't do. Right? The man could have not stretched forth his hand. He could have said, well, I can't. Right? But faith doesn't say I can't. Faith says I... I see, what happened when, when Jesus said... Why did Jesus say, stretch forth your hand? Because he heard his father say, tell the man to stretch forth his hand. And when Jesus said, stretch forth your hand, there was an enablement within that man. He was fully persuaded. So he just, okay. He didn't sit here and go, well, how's that? How? Nope. He, look, at, look at the story. And he did so, and his hand was restored whole as the other. You would think these guys would at least be happy. But no, they're freaking out. It look, look at this. They were filled with madness and communed one with another what they might do to him. Evil, good. Jesus, why do we read this story? He went about doing good and healing. Healing is good. God wants you healed because God never changes. I love that. Let's go back to Psalm 100. Hallelujah. Psalm 100. Let me find a scripture here. Hallelujah. Let's look at verses 4 and 5. The Bible tells us, enter his gates with thanksgiving. Enter his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. Why? Why is he good? His mercy is everlasting. And his truth endures to all generations. Here we have, it doesn't say the Lord is good sometime. He's always good. So if there's something going on in your life, don't ever blame God because he couldn't possibly be anything but good. And if you will get in the word and get the word in you, you'll be able to discern good from evil and you'll know. You'll see that this thing that's happened in my life, that was not of him. That was of the enemy. And you'll keep your eye on who you should have your eye on. This is so important. So now let's jump over to Psalm 86. Hallelujah. Psalm 86 in verse 5. Look at this. It says here, For thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive. He's always ready to forgive. And plenteous in mercy upon all that call upon his name. Wow. Let's keep going. Let's go to Psalm 25. Psalm 25. In verse 8, 
Hallelujah. I love these scriptures. It says, good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, look at this, will he teach sinners in the way. In the way of what? In the way of God. See, why does God love the sinner? Because he's good. Look at this, verse 1. Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. O my God, I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed. New Testament believer, I trust in thee. I will not be ashamed. Let not mine enemies triumph over me. New Testament believer, you have given me victory and triumph over my enemies. Yea, let none of them, let none that wait on thee be ashamed. Let them be ashamed which transgress without cause. Look at this, verse 4. Show me thy ways, O Lord. Teach me thy paths. Lead me in the truth and teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation. And what? On thee do I wait all the day. Remember, O Lord, thy tender mercies and thy loving kindness, for they have been ever of old. Remember not the sins of my youth, nor my transgressions according to thy mercy. Remember thou me for thy goodness sake, O Lord. New Testament believer, he's already told us, your sins have been erased. There's nothing to remember. And then it finishes by saying, good and upright is the Lord. Wow. So now jump back to Romans 4. I'm sorry, Romans chapter 2, verse 4. Actually, I'm not sorry. I apologize. Okay. So Romans chapter 2, verse 4. It says, Or despiseth thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering? Not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? This word repentance is a military term. We would say it this way, about face. It is literally, it's not remorse. There's no emotion in this word repent. It's literally you make a decision to change your direction. Remorse is, man, I'm so sorry for what I did. And what you really mean is, I'm still going to keep doing it, and it just stinks that this is not what I'm supposed to do. And you think, well, how could anybody ever do that? Is there anybody here that's never done that? Right? Wow, don't, don't raise your hand. We won't have a pray for liars service, right? <laughs> Literally, God loves you, and he's got mercy for you. Don't despise his long suffering and all of these things. Why would we not despise it? Because we know that the goodness of God leads me to repentance. The, the fact that I know that he's always good will lead me to change my mind, my will, and my purpose to, go, to stop going this direction and go this direction. Do you know how many Christians are trying to hang on to what they want to do in their life and, and God's not in it? And that's why as they are moving in this direction, he's not in it. So there's no blessing. And, and this is how it'll come out. It'll always come out in your behavior. It'll always come out in your behavior. Why? Because how do you get your behavior right? I don't keep myself. He keeps me. So I just stay where he wants me, and he'll keep me. And if I start wondering, man, I'll come back. The Holy Spirit doesn't convict me of sin. My own spirit does. And I stay very sensitive, right? The Holy Spirit, my spirit will say, what are you doing? And then the Holy Spirit will say, forget about that. Confess it and let's go. I, I, I got to take you places, Right? repentance. I'm turning from going one direction and I'm going another direction. It's the goodness of God that will lead you to change. Are there, is there anything you need to change in your life? See, this is how you fail. You start to really work. I mean, it's January, right? 
Go to a gym right now. They're full. Everybody, this is my year, right? This is the year I'm going to lose all of my weight, right? I'm going to get in shape. Well, just relax, right? Just, you know, endure that. You, you know, you've been at a gym before, right? And, and you have to do a lat pull down. And here's this guy. He's got five pounds on there, and he's like this. He's about to hurt himself, and, he, and he's just kind of, you know, and you're like. And then he sits there, looks on his phone, checks his, and you're going, I need to work out. Well, just wait, wait about four weeks, and then the gyms will clear out, right? Because to change something, the goodness of God will cause you to change. See, if you need to change something that's an addiction in your life, you need to realize God is so good, he broke the power of that off of me. This thing I'm feeling is just in my mind, it doesn't really have power over me. It'll, it'll cause me to change. Does, does that make sense? So go to Psalm 145. Let's go back here. Psalm 145. Hallelujah. Wow, that clock goes so fast in this church. Look at verse 7. It says, They shall abundantly utter the memory of thy great goodness and shall sing... Of thy righteousness. Jump down to verse 9. The Lord is good to all. He's good to all. Look at this. And his tender mercies are over all of his works. Wow. Well, let's look at some of those benefits. Let's go to Psalm 103. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Psalm 103, it says here, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not. He's, you're telling your soul, don't forget his benefits. Right? What are his benefits? Who forgives all of your iniquities? Do you realize everything's been forgiven? As you sit here, if Jesus were to come back for you right now, you would stand before a holy God and you would never have to give an account for your sin. Because it's gone. It's completely gone. The, the blood is still on the mercy seat in heaven, forever testifying and speaking that your sins have been obliterated. So anything that could bring death in your life has been paid for. He also heals all of your diseases. He also redeemeth, who redeemeth your life. Actually, it says this in the Hebrew, who constantly is redeeming your life from destruction and who crowneth you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your, you, or your mouth with good things. In other words, he will give your mouth what to say so that what? Your youth is renewed like the eagles. I love that. When a golden eagle would get sick, the golden in, in, in the Middle East, that golden eagle, six-foot wingspan, a golden eagle will fly up on an inaccessible cliff and will lay on its back and put its, put its wings out like this and just lay there. They have multiple eyelids and they look directly at the sun until they're healed. That's what it's talking about. How do we do this looking at the sun? By speaking. What do we speak? The Holy Spirit will give you what to speak. And as you speak his word, it will renew you like the eagle. Wow. Go to Psalm 52. Psalm 52. Hallelujah. We're, kind of, we're coming down to the end of this here. We're going to have to pause. Psalm 52. Look at this, right in the end of verse 1, it says, The goodness of God endures continually. The goodness of God endures continually. Isn't that good news? I love that scripture because when you're not taking advantage of the goodness of God, guess what? He never pulls it away. 
it will endure all of your nonsense until, and the Holy Spirit will just keep wooing you to make decisions to embrace God. It'll endure continually. His mercies are new to you every morning. So step number one in 2024, stop beating yourself up. Give yourself a break. Take your eyes off your behavior and put your eyes on Jesus and start to taste and see that he is good. And what will happen is some things in your life that maybe you weren't even aware you needed to change, all of a sudden, a desire will start welling up in you. I need to make some adjustments. And, and you'll start, you'll go, oh, I didn't realize I, I need to get out of this environment and I need to go to this environment. We are living in a time of incredible self-centeredness, so that's pride and it blinds people. Christians, are their behavior is so outside of where God would have them. And, and if they are born again, they're miserable on the inside because everything about their life is violating their heart. And God doesn't want that for you. He's not mad at you. Actually, knowing that he's mad would not cause you to change. It'd cause you to run from him. But he just is not, he's not mad. He's good. And he's wanting you to just, he, he wants you to taste and see that he's good. How do you taste? You start, you take the word of God, and when a scripture jumps off the page, you chew on it. Have you ever got cheap gum? Fruit stripes. I used to like fruit stripes gum as a kid. You guys know, you put that in your mouth, it's like it tastes great for about three seconds. But when you chew on the word of God, you just chew it and chew it and chew it. It actually, the flavor gets better and better and better, and you want more and more and more. And pretty soon, in the midst of just going, wow, he loves me. Wow, he's good. Wow, he's got a future for me. Oh, my goodness, you know what? I need to make that adjustment. Here, Lord, here, help me with this. Because, And you, you're not even, you're not focused on you anymore. You Help me overcome this. Hey, I got this, this, this alcohol. You're drinking alcohol. You don't even think it's a problem. You're out with your buddies. You're out with whatever. And all of a sudden, the Lord goes, hey, you know, this has got more of a hold on you. I don't want this to have this hold on you. I want you to set it down. You're like, okay. Because he's so good, you don't need this anymore. He's so good. You start minding your own business, and all of a sudden, you realize, wow, you know what? He wants me to lose some weight and get healthy. Well, you know what? Okay, help me. Help me with this. And he's like, yeah. But how do you come to the place to change? You won't know to change if you don't taste that he's good because the goodness of God is what leads you to change. Do you see that? There's so many Christians that are trying to be better Christians. Listen, you can't be better than what he made you. But you can walk out the behaviors of Jesus as you feed on him. Amen? He, first of all, you got to see what to change. And here's the thing. You might be like me. Years and years ago, it's like, okay, what do I need to change? I feel like I need to change everything. How in the world can I, where do I start? Oh, the, the Holy Spirit loves that. No, never mind. Forget about all the other stuff. Start right here. And sometimes you look at that right here and go, well, that's not the biggest issue in my life. Just keep your eyes on him. Give that to him. When you get free in that area, man, you'll just be so happy. And then all of a sudden you go, okay, let's talk about this area. Give this one to me. And you go from glory to glory. You keep your eyes on the word of God. You're transformed into his image. 